magic and how to discover and fulfill your true will. There is nothing so vital, so essential as finding and living one's purpose in life. In the Western magical tradition, we call this the true will, Thalema. In Hinduism, it is Dharma. In Taoism, the Tao. The true will is transcendent and not easily definable. It isn't a chosen career or a lifestyle or a projected identity. It is one's purpose for existing at all. Discovering and then enacting one's true will is the primary goal of all true and initiated magic, yoga, meditation, and spiritual practice. All else is bondage. Nothing could be more simple, and yet nothing is more practically difficult. The common wisdom that to achieve confidence, success, and happiness in life you should just be yourself or follow your heart is absolutely correct. However, what these sayings leave out is that becoming yourself, fully manifesting yourself as the person that you know in your heart you are capable of becoming, is not a given. It never was at any time in history, and it never will be. It takes hard work, training, and a lot of guidance along the way. It requires constant attention and vigilance. It often requires specialized tools, practices, and methods. Magic, yoga, and meditation are those methods. They are the martial arts of the mind and of the soul. They are ancient, they are precise, and they work, provided one follows authentic methods, under authentic guidance, and doesn't get lured into the swamp of nothingness by common merchants offering false teachings, New Age cotton candy, and goth gobbledygook. The work happens in two phases. The first is journeying within to uncover the true will. The second is bringing everything one has to bear on manifesting that true will in the world, in your life. And it is work, the great work. If this were not the case, we would all be born knowing exactly what we want to do with our lives and launch like rockets towards our destinies without any interruption as soon as we could walk and talk. Yet it is not so. Our destiny in potential may be a birthright, But achieving that destiny most certainly is not. That can't be given, not even by the gods themselves. It must be earned. Even great historical figures who seem, in retrospect, as if they were locked on to a singular overwhelming purpose from the get-go, born to fulfill a specific destiny, really only look this way with the benefit of hindsight. It was their efforts, their decisions, and their sacrifices that made them what they became. And also more than that, it was also the hand of providence shown in seemingly random occurrences, coincidences, fateful meetings, dreams, visions, even events that appeared to be disasters at the time. And yet even providence is not neutral. It is man's own effort, his will, his daring, and even his perhaps foolhardy and irrational courage in dedicating himself to a transcendent ideal and purpose that catches the eye of providence. And that is even if, in the beginning, the transcendent purpose he dedicates himself to is finding that very purpose at all. Conversely, it is the shirking of that ideal and sacred task and the resulting plunge downwards into apathy, a mistake all too often made after one's initial successes, that causes that eye to look elsewhere. The true will is an ideal in potential. It is a guiding light. One finds that light and then follows it, striving never to deviate over the course of one's life. Such constitutes the path, and it is a path and a never-ending one at that. Many popular books on the esoteric side of life would have you believe that the true will is revealed in one dramatic instant, and it may well be. Yet this is but one moment, and perhaps a moment no more truly important than any other, in a work that unfolds and reveals itself over the efforts of a lifetime. Nothing on this path is a given. Nothing is predictable. The experience of others, even those who also walk the path, can only ever be a helpful and suggestive guide, as your life and your will are your own. We are all given a map for life made up of the expectations of others, of society, of parents, of teachers, 
of books, of media, of our own early attempts to understand life. But the true will, being transcendent, will tear that map to pieces, all too often causing jarring and dramatic changes to one's sense of identity or life plan. Napoleon Bonaparte, for instance, wanted to be a writer as a shy and withdrawn young man. His teachers remarked only that his skill in math, history, and geography might make him a good sailor. This unremarkable, diminutive, and constantly bullied boy even wrote a romantic novella before he was pushed into military training and was then forced, by the death of his father and a resulting lack of funds, to hastily complete that training and join active service. Only 20 years later, Bonaparte was crowned Emperor of France. So assured of his own absolute authority was he that at the height of the coronation, presided over by Pope Pius VII in Notre Dame Cathedral, Napoleon broke with tradition and broke history itself by taking the crown from the Pope's hands and placing it upon his own head, crowning himself by his own divine mandate and none other. At 15, the withdrawn and bookish child. At 35, Caesar enthroned. At 42, emperor of all continental Europe, from the Spanish coast in the west to the Carpathian mountains in the east, singular force reshaping all world history, conforming an empire to the ideals of the Enlightenment, instituting a new ideological world order that we still labor beneath today. So much each of us be in our own lives. Regent. We must not only heed the call to adventure, to battle, but we must battle. We must conquer the unknown continents within, the unruly strata of the mind, and unite all our aspects and selves under one transcendent banner. This is the total war of the Mahabharata and Ramayana, of the Kala Chakra, of the Iliad, of Ragnarok, of Revelation. All those who look outside themselves for the meaning of the scriptures will find only hallucination and mirage. Look within and see. We are born with a muddle of impressions. Genetics, social and cultural input, karmic accretions from other times and places. Each of us is a shouting throng of demons and gods, half-expressed selves and personalities, all of which now vie for space with the cultural mimetics pumped into our minds daily by the wide-gauge sewage pipe of electronic media. Beneath this is the true will, unchanging and fixed, awaiting rescue from that maddening crowd. None but the bravest knights shall succeed in fighting their way to that grail in this quicksand age of darkness, ignorance, and despair. And even fewer still shall lift that grail as the sign of their own divine authority over their own multiverse of selves and turn to conquer that cacophonous horde, disciplining it into a fighting force with singular will. This divine authority over our own selves and none other is assumed through the ongoing work of meditation and ritual. Thus do we become regent over our own lives and master the course of our fate. And whether that course is predetermined and destined or shaped by free will makes no practical difference. For the magician, for the awakened, free will is the chisel that reveals the destined man within the stone. That which was there all along, yet would never have been revealed without the constant persevering, conscious effort of the sculptor. That which proceeds from a man's soul shall shape his soul. That which proceeds from his speech shall shape his speech, and deeds that proceed from his body shall shape his body. Yukio Mishima The development of the will, therefore, requires training. This training must run contrary to nearly all facets of modern life, as our society is a kind of technological engine for detraining will. And unlike early totalitarian societies, it no longer even seeks to retrain that will to the service of the state or of religion. Instead, it erodes and chews at that will entirely, casting it about in a storm of destruction. A thousand and one app notifications and social media interruptions, emails, advertisements in every conceivable medium and on every conceivable surface, news media that exist to agitate rather than inform and provide only disconnected bits of data without ever showing the big picture. The teeth of Koranzon. There is, however, good news. The methods for training the will are as established, time-tested, 
and essentially unchanging as the methods for training the body. Running and lifting heavy things made you strong back in ancient Rome, and it makes you strong now. Likewise, meditation, yoga, and ritual have worked in the same fashion to strengthen the soul for tens of thousands of years. They worked long before Alexander the Great, believing himself the greatest warrior in history, conquered the known world before reaching India, where he found Brahmin yogis who laughed in his face. Before these great sages and adepts, who had conquered themselves, even Alexander's accomplishments were meaningless. Here, then, are the primary methods. First, yoga. Specifically, this means the hard practice of Raja Yoga, attaining single-pointed focus through the long and often severe practice of meditation and the physical disciplines that surround it. This practice is now made doubly severe by the fact that it is the exact metaphysical opposite of the character of modern life itself. The acrobatic postures that are commonly referred to as yoga in the marketplace are only really subsidiary practices to Raja Yoga, designed to strengthen the body to be able to hold meditative posture for long periods of time. While helpful, they are not a means in themselves and are certainly not the main event of yoga, nor are they even inherently spiritual. Similarly, the types of meditation pushed in the mass marketplace, tepid exercises in positive thinking, apps designed by people who have never done an hour's worth of honest meditation in their life, or so-called guided meditations in which some eunuch assures you that you can do it over a background of flute samples have absolutely nothing to do with real meditation, although they may be a useful introduction for those who are completely new, provided they pass on quickly. The goal of yoga is total. It is the fundamental rewiring of the brain so that it can direct all of its mental power towards exactly one thing at a time. That one thing can also be no thing, and often should be. The next method is magic. Magic is the ritual enactment of will. While meditation and yoga train the will internally, behind closed eyes, magic is an external focusing of that will via symbols, actions, gestures, and so on, with the goal of causing change in the magician's universe. Such change may be willed in one's transitory material conditions, but more often, the change is internal the awakening and guiding of the inner faculties of the mind, soul, and body that have been so diligently buried by our mass-hypnotized and mass-hypnotizing society. As the great chaos magician and writer Ramsey Dukes has argued, humanity's endeavors to understand the universe can be divided into four quadrants, science, religion, art, and finally magic, which can inform the other three, but which is also separate from them. This was also Duke's way of removing the underground world of occult enthusiasts from the culture war and allowing magic to occupy a position that is participatory, but not bound by the never-ending warfare of the other three magisteria. This stance of being just close enough to watch the fight from the sidelines, occasionally get a clever zinger in, and then run off with bits of the combatants' treasure while they're too busy fighting, is the kind of stance that befits magicians and shamans anyway. As a group, we tend to be far more concerned with what we can get away with than with being right, particularly as we change our mind about almost everything on a daily basis anyway. There are far too many entertaining ideas to think, ideologies to entertain, and people to be in this world to get tied down by any of them, let alone get conscripted into defending them. So, science is the discipline of understanding objective reality, the physical universe that we all share. Religion is a set of myths and ethical precepts designed for large groups of people to follow in order to live well and maintain social cohesion. Art is a medium for skilled professionals to create and transmit subjective meaning, meant to enhance one's appreciation of life or to increase empathy by allowing one to imagine life from others' perspectives. Magic, however, is a set of tools for exploring your own mind and making your own meaning. It is purely personal, purely subjective, and although the insights gained by magic can never truly be shared by others, they can certainly inspire the creation of art, religion, and sometimes even scientific breakthroughs. Magic also has nothing to do with doctrine or dogma. Religious doctrines are the excrement of magicians, the cast-offs left by their experimental forays into consciousness, which are then adopted as inherited truth by those too weak to hunt for themselves. There is no received truth in magic, there are no intermediaries other than hopefully helpful teachers who simply endeavor to show others how to get started. 
All subjective meaning is generated by the magician, not given secondhand by an artist or priest. In this way, magic is closest to science, although it is surely not scientific in the traditional sense. While science applies the experimental method to find objective truths about matter, magic applies the experimental method to find subjective truths about spirit. That subjective truth, which each magician must discover for themselves, is the nature and contour of the true will, the shape of things to come. Taken together, yoga and magic will first train and then direct one's mind. Yet this training is worthless if it is not directed towards first the discovery, and then the actualization of the true will. And veering from this well-lit, if admittedly thorny, path can end one in the vaporous swamps of delusion. Developing tremendous willpower without a clear sense of purpose only leads one to become a jack-of-all-trades and master of none, obsessively pursuing a thousand interests without unifying one's forces into the steady stream necessary to produce mastery of life. Ultimately, yoga and magic are only training, and one's temple space or meditation mat only a kind of virtual reality simulation where one's critical faculties are honed. Those skills must then be put to use in manifesting the true will in the world. Put to use, for instance, in mastering one's chosen profession and career, or in maintaining a stable, lasting, and fulfilling relationship, or in raising a family, and ultimately, in making one's masterwork contribution to humanity, in whatever form that takes. These may sound like mundane goals. They are anything but. Particularly in today's quicksand world, the obstacles to achieving these goals are more daunting and well-armed and seemingly unconquerable than any dragon or rival sorcerer any medieval wizard had to overcome. And they must be confronted, even if victory is uncertain, as even death in sacred battle against one's own circumstances would be preferable to the honorless humiliation of never trying at all. Lieber ein end mit Schrecken als ein Schrecken und end. Better an end with horror than unending horror, said the Prussian Major Ferdinand Baptista von Schill, who fought Napoleon to the end. His forces outnumbered three to one and fell with honor at the Battle of Strasland in Sweden. Failing to train the will at all and surrendering to the seductive comforts and easy answers of modern life will simply mean that one is carried away by the current of the age itself, by the tides of mass opinion and the slow, interminable karmic cycle of credit and debit that has held all conscious life in its vulture-like claws for 10,000 inescapable kalpas. These tides may take you to the gutter, or even, perhaps, to all of the material comforts that most associate with success in life. Both, however, will be equally meaningless, for they will not have been produced in accordance with your own transcendent will, which cries out even now to be recognized, just as it has all your life but instead by the impersonal mass forces and undertow of history itself. God formed man from dust, and so must man form his own destiny from the arbitrary debris of circumstance, or be lost to it. You must create the right kind of dream, the sober, adult kind of magic, illusion born from disillusion. Sylvia Plath But we must not let ourselves get too carried away. Magic can be an intoxicating, bewildering world full of astral swamp fumes that have led more than a few young hopefuls into lives of delusional, quixotic pirouetting. In many ways, I quite like that the millennia-old sacred tradition of the West is called magic, as the word itself suggests the complete redefinition or even destruction of all presuppositions about reality, and that anything may be possible after all. This is as good of a position as any to start one's experimental inquiry into the nature of reality. It is certainly better than atheism, which assumes too much, and denies the possibility of any supermaterial phenomena whatsoever, which, while freeing one of the embarrassment of being seen to hold to unprovable ideas, just because I like them, that is, on faith, as the religious say, is liable to lead one to the material dialectics of Marxism, or worse, Reddit. Assuming that the universe is a purely magical phenomena turns out to be quite good as a philosophical platform. It is honest, as it is both an admission that you know absolutely nothing about existence, which we certainly do not, 
and also a clear signal to others that they should take extreme pains not to take anything you say seriously. This forms clean laboratory conditions for experimental work. In one move, it cuts you off from anything the culture around you takes as accepted truth. Good. Now, not only do you know that you know nothing, but the people around you know that you know nothing. Pristine innocence. The fool's leap. Now you can begin. Upon taking that fool's leap, however, you will soon make the disheartening discovery that you have landed in even worse territory than you were in before. Because even though you may have taken the act of a sacred fool, you will now find yourself surrounded by people who are simply idiots. And these will not even be the kind of idiots you were surrounded by when you were still bound by the consensus trance. Unquestioningly believing the news might be just as cosmically doltish as unquestioningly believing in fairies, but at least talking about the former in public will not lessen your employability or romantic prospects. The edges of some medieval maps were famous for featuring etchings of dragons, accompanied, of course, by the phrase, here be dragons. This was undoubtedly a playful convention, like modern political cartoons, an admission that nobody knew what lay past that point and that traveling that far in the ocean was liable to be a pain in the ass anyway, or possibly that just bringing it up in conversation was liable to get people riled up and arguing about what might be there, the kind of people that corner you by the snack table at parties to tell you about their home brewing project for two hours without letting you get in a word edgewise, or escape, and that it was probably best to let that particular dragon lie. This likely did not, however, mean that people actually believed the dragons lived there. Unlike today, where people not only believe that dragons live at the edges of the flat earth, but create entire Facebook groups, and subreddits, and podcasts about it, and gather people all around them that tell them how right they are, and will argue you into the ground if you dare suggest otherwise. So it is with much of what passes for magic. Even a cursory glance at occult social media groups or web pages will reveal a thousand varieties of people who are not merely interested in playing with belief, but who literally dogmatically, non-playfully believe in irrational things. You will find people discussing all the finer points of conjuring the devil, or at least his distant cousin twice removed, who gibber over this or that grimoire, or channeled writings that mainly seem to underline how special the channeler is, or ancient astronaut theories, or schizoid obsessing over numerology and synchronicity, or never-ending tunnels of conspiracies that lead from one Wikipedia page to the next for all eternity or people claiming that they are really, really quite magical. No, really super serious magical, because they have the 180 pseudo-Masonic degrees and tattoos to prove it, or the usual never-ending statements of how so-and-so is a hereditary witch, and traces her lineage back to the burning times, when the patriarchy tried to suppress all the sacred wisdom of the earth, and oh boy, are they all going to be sorry now that I can hex the world with my orgasms, and P.S., fuck you, Dad, even though said witch is named Mandy and worked at Jamba Juice at the Pinecrest Mall not five years ago, and was still pretty heavy into Christian rock at the time. These are people who have gotten lost in the vapors. They are mistaking the shadows cast on the wall by magic for the work itself. There is one, and only one, sure guide through this land of fog and shadows. And that is simply remembering that magic, like yoga and meditation, is a set of tools. That's it. It's a toolbox, and the toolbox is not particularly interesting in its own right, although many do indeed waste their lives rummaging around in it, trying to find the perfect tool, or obsessing over the construction of the tools, or writing academic papers about the problematic social assumptions inherent in the tools, or whatever other unfortunate unconscious strategy they have developed to prevent themselves from doing any real work. Ultimately, however, the tools are not important in and of themselves, as they have only one use— uncovering the true will, finding the meaning and purpose of life for you while understanding that the answers to the riddle of initiation are different for everyone. It should also be pointed out, as this is a point of much confusion, that the reason that there are so many tools in magic, so much stuff, tarot, Kabbalah, runes, astral travel, lucid dreams, devotional practice, yoga, etc., etc., ad infinitum, and thank you kindly, says Amazon, after you've spent years buying all those books and tchotchkes, and did I already mention you could have had a private jet by now, is not to unnecessarily confuse you or saddle you with the never-ending task of having to master all of them. It's because there are so many different types of people in the world. 
Different tools are required for different people with different personality types. And unless you're unfortunate enough so as to be a teacher of magic, as I am, in which case you must be expected to know and master all of them in order to better help students, make your life easier by just focusing on what works for you. As skill in yoga and magic improve over whatever time scale it takes, the true will begins to make itself known. Of course, discovering the true will is not a clear-cut, logical, straightforward process. Discovering one's will is not nearly as simple as deciding that one is supposed to be a doctor or a painter or living one's best life. In all likelihood, a magical genie will not appear to you to announce that you, Kevin Eustace Higginbottom, a.k.a. Fletcher Dankblast 69 of the Order of Obsidian Outer Darkness, are the chosen one, he who is destined to lead the greatest office supply sales staff in the greater Cincinnati area, with the aid of the very hosts of heaven and hordes of hell at his beck and call. You know, just by squinting and thinking about it very, very hard when that jackass Dave that they promoted to VP for some reason is sneakily hovering behind you while you're working to see if you're browsing our shower thoughts on company time again. The true will will not make your teeth whiter. It will not get you a verified blue check mark on Twitter, although I can't figure out why anyone might want one at this point. It will not manifest as sudden and overwhelming success by the standards of the spiritually sick culture that you live in. It will not carry you to an enchanted life of Instagram influence, whiling your days away driving your Lamborghini in the Hollywood Hills while feverishly screeching at young men on YouTube that they too could be rich beyond their wildest dreams if they simply remembered that their attitude determines their altitude and started reading Malcolm Gladwell books while microdosing acid and drop shipping keto supplements on Amazon and creating a new cryptocurrency based on how many ab crunches you can do in an infrared sauna or some such insufferable nonsense. The path is far subtler than that. It is a process and a conversation between oneself and the universe. The true will is like a groove one fits into, where you put one foot in front of the other, filled with a deep sense, although it may come only in fleeting moments, that one is on the right track, and which may or may not be confirmed by the presence of flow states and synchronicities. People imagine that magic and meditation will grant them some extra power, and hoard around foaming at the mouth looking for some secret way to make themselves better than their neighbors at long last. But it will do no such thing. It will only make them into themselves and reveal what was theirs all along. At times, the true will unfolds completely beyond one's conscious awareness, even though aligning with it requires conscious effort at others. Napoleon, forced into military training by his father and then forced to complete it on a rush time scale, by his father's death, would have perceived his situation at the time as unfair, even cosmically unjust. Yet looking back on his life at its end, exiled on St. Helena, Napoleon would have clearly seen that it could not have been any other way. He would have seen the hand of providence revealed. Moral. Actually go back and read your magical record. That's what the belabored thing is there for. To fulfill your true will is to fulfill what you are made for. And nothing could be better, more rewarding, than to consciously play the part that the universe has cast you in, in the cosmic dance of Shiva, with grace and grit, perhaps to the standing ovation of the gods themselves. All of the rest of the things that people long for, and imagine that magic will bring them, fame, fortune, adulation, 127.4 Bitcoin, it's not that these things are illusions, but that they are simply set pieces, decorations that are either useful or not, depending on what role you happen to be playing on the stage. They are baubles of no real substance in and of themselves. Without purpose, without a sense of connection to your true capital S self, you can have all of the billions and yachts and titles in the world and still be suffering in an emotional hell. Witness William Randolph Hearst, or perhaps Jeff Bezos, or countless other rich and miserable or famous and miserable individuals. With purpose and connected to one's own transcendental axis, one's true self, you can have nothing and live in bliss. You can wander the world naked with only a begging bowl and a stick and live as a god in the cosmic dance. One of my lineage gurus, Sri Dadaji Mahendranath, did exactly that, wandering India as a naked sadhu and wizard for decades, after Aleister Crowley sent the traumatized young World War I trench medic there to seek enlightenment. 
It is the very essence of yoga, as it is of Buddhism, that all one needs to experience absolute and transcendent bliss and joy is within one's own body, right here, right now. In fact, all else, from the greatest of world achievements to the hardest of hard drugs, pale in comparison to the yoke of yoga. Man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. Arthur Schopenhauer This discovery of personal will is not solipsism. It is not a shirking of one's duties to the world. It is not an excuse to vanish into one's own navel. It is, in fact, inseparable from one's duty to the world, one's dharma. If there is one problem that is fundamental to our society, it is the loss of will. Not just personal will, but group will, although the latter deficiency proceeds from the former. As people, we have lost our wills, and therefore, as a people, we have lost our will. We face serious, even potentially species-annihilating problems, the seemingly unstoppable consolidation of social control by technocrats, the artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons arms race, state and stateless terrorism, hunger, homelessness, a global economy built on nothing but elaborate and arcane bluffs and pure farce, the erasure of the American middle class, the disintegration of journalism, the increasing implosion of the first world democracies and of the post-World War II world order, and the ongoing collapse of the biosphere, for starters. All of these problems, all of them, could be solved with sufficient political will. That means will on the part of both societies and of individuals. Recent history and even current events have no shortage of singular figures who have dramatically shifted the opinions and actions of entire populations, as if by will alone. Ultimately, we have no choice but to muster the will to confront these issues, no matter how global and abstract they seem, as all of them will in time filter down to touch each of our individual lives. Like it or not, these demons will come to our doorstep. Our personal challenges thus become even more important, in a way, than the global big picture, as our personal challenges are the ones that we have the power to do battle with, and thereby to do our share to overcome the wider global issues of which they are part. Consider the seemingly small personal obstacles that each of us must face, yet which take on supreme importance when it is understood that each represents our own individual share of response to the global crisis, and that these valiant efforts do not occur in isolation but are occurring in tandem as above, so below. There is the challenge of maintaining and growing a successful career in the face of globalization, the constantly changing workplace, and the approaching loss of nearly all U.S. jobs to automation, outsourcing, or obsolescence. There is the challenge of maintaining sanity, let alone decency, in a post-truth world driven mad by social media, unreliable information sources, and ever-increasing political polarization. There is the challenge of maintaining health in a world where the air and water are full of toxic industrial chemicals and the food we are offered is a kind of chemical genetic parody of naturally grown fruits, vegetables, grains, or naturally rather than industrially farmed or hunted animals. Consider, for instance, that even in health-obsessed California, finding produce that is both completely natural and grown in non-depleted topsoil fertilized by healthy livestock and crop rotation rather than chemicals that is, the standard condition of food until the mid-20th century, is a surprisingly difficult and expensive task, and that only a half dozen to a dozen items of this quality, like carrots, beets, and eggs, can be found at any given time and are sold at a tremendous premium. Indeed, for many people in the United States and elsewhere, even attaining to the basic standard of life enjoyed by one's parents or grandparents, clean food, jobs, affordable housing, a comparatively non-psychotoxic culture, a focus on values and decency is practically impossible. For many millennials, the idea of buying a house is infinitely more far-fetched than the idea that sorcery might be real. It is the loss of will that has allowed these horrors to take root. This disease of will is symptomatic of the fundamental entropic nature of both the human condition and of the spirit of the age itself. Yet neither the spirit of an age nor even the human condition itself can stand in the way of applied will. All history stands as a testament to this fact. So stand up. This is why I created Magic.me. 
for those who will stand up and be counted. I can't bear to see people drift and waste their lives, certainly not conscious people of which the world is already drastically underpopulated. We need those, and we need them to be effective in body, mind, and soul instead of ruminating and self-doubting. I have already explained the importance and method of training the will. Magic.me is the gym where you do it. Magic.me is an online school where I teach the skills of yoga, magic, and meditation. It is not a mystery school as there are no mysteries or mystification. There are no grades or titles. There is no time-wasting foolishness. I present the material as it is, without the superstition, new age woo, or goth silliness it has previously been associated with. Just the pure techniques, practically, clearly, and safely taught, and structured into concise video units so that you can learn and apply the material at your own pace. When you subscribe to Magic.me, you get access to all of the courses I've ever recorded. That includes everything from Chaos Magic to Raja Yoga to a full, comprehensive course on unlocking your true will. It includes learning how to use magic to tap into incredible wells of artistic inspiration on achieving peak mental and physical energy, banishing rituals, astral projection, learning the tarot and I Ching, psychic protection, lucid dreaming, and even a crash course in Enochian magic, the most potent form of magic on earth, perhaps. There is also the Magician's Workshop, a year-long course plan and syllabus that walks you through learning magic skill by skill, step by step, allowing you to build quickly and in logical sequence what most struggle to understand for decades by instead waiting around and haphazardly piecing together information from an endless quicksand of books and online forums that are liable only to lead to confusion, an empty pocketbook, and, even worse, countless hours spent arguing online over petty technicalities with neo-pagan know-it-alls, indistinguishable from the comic book store guy from The Simpsons. Magic.me saves you all that time and all that money by showing you the clear, well-lit, and direct path. You'll also have access to our private Discord forums, where you can become part of a thriving community and discuss what you're learning with other students. Over the previous months, I've also added an additional 60 plus hours of bonus material drawn from live question and answer sessions with students, in which we cover magic as it is lived in an exquisite level of detail not available anywhere else in the world. Of course, as a subscriber, you'll also have access to the bi-weekly live sessions in which I'll answer your personal questions about the path and your experiments one-on-one. -on -one. In all, there are over 120 hours of recorded video instruction at magic.me on every conceivable aspect of practical magic and meditation. Of course, there's no need to watch all of it. You can get started in just a few minutes a day. We now live in a world in which every second of our time is demanded by something. And knowing that all too well myself, I've constructed magic.me so that you can take the classes in small, bite-sized segments on your desktop or phone. Even five minutes a day on a break will allow you to continue building your skills surely and steadily. Tuition is an investment of only $49 a month, and that covers everything I've mentioned. Even more generous prices are offered for yearly or lifetime subscriptions. You can, of course, cancel at any time. If you're completely new to this and you're curious, but you don't really know what to expect and you just want to try it out and see if it's right for you, I make that really, really easy for you to do without any risk. The best way to do that is just subscribe and see what you think. If you don't like it and you tell me so prior to watching your seventh unit, I'll refund 100% of your money, no questions asked, in line with the terms listed on the site. I certainly don't need your money and I'm not going to water the content down to appeal to the masses just to get a few dollars. I want the people who take my classes to be sure they're the right match for them, and I want to give you the opportunity to decide that for yourself without any strings attached or personal risk. If you decide it's not right for you, that's great. You won't have spent a dime. If it is right for you, and you commit to blasting off into the far reaches of the known cosmos, along with the rest of our steady crew, you'll be saving yourself tremendous amounts of money, time, and frustration by taking the direct guided route instead of trying to learn by trial and error chasing dead ends, and burning way too much money on heaps of only halfway helpful books. However, and I can't stress this enough, Magic.me is not for everyone. And before you fully sign on, I want to make that very, very clear. 
I am not interested in flakes, dabblers, and dilettantes. I do not want new age drifters who hop from one subject or course or system to the next, looking only to confirm what they already believe and quickly bouncing to the next shiny object as soon as they have to make some actual effort. People can waste their whole lives this way, jumping ship as soon as they get far enough to start to see the work they need to do on themselves clearly so that they never truly work through their blocks or do anything for that matter. If you want to waste your life that way, that's your business, but I don't carry anyone. And I'm deadly serious about that. I expect people to carry themselves. I think everything up to this point should have made that abundantly clear. And I think that those of you who are truly willing to do the work will appreciate that attitude of respect towards your sincere efforts. Likewise, if you simply want to drape yourself in the symbolism of magic and make yourself sound wise by parroting my words, and impress members of the opposite sex because magic is trendy with young people right now, then steer clear. I do not want trend followers and I do not want opportunists. The world already groans under the weight of tens of thousands of fake wizards, and I'm not interested in them or creating more of them. I want the few who do, not the many who talk. And finally, and most importantly of all, I do not want people with ill intent if you come to this seeking power over other people or thinking you can use it to do ill deeds, magic itself will likely find you out even sooner than I do. You will be expelled and cast out with a firm kick from the universe for your troubles. I do want sincere, dedicated students who honestly want to learn and to improve themselves and the world around them. Nothing more. And by the way, if you want to use this stuff to improve your material success, then by all means do so. I encourage you to, as long as you do so with the intent of helping and giving to the world, not taking from it, the world could use a lot more successful conscious people. If this is you, then I very much look forward to seeing you in class and watching your breakthroughs and your growth in the shape and direction of your true will. The website is www.magic.me, that's M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E, magic.me. I'll see you in class. Thank you.